If you haven't uh, had a course with Graham or uh, been on one of his webinars, he has been an instructor um, now 20 plus years, both with IBM and Global Knowledge. We're privileged to have him as one of our own. Um, he has more certifications than even on the screen and, and uh, more than, more than uh, most. And so Graham is one of our top instructors here at Global Knowledge. We're glad to have you again here, Graham. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to this uh, webinar on SQL Server. Uh, my name, as you can actually see through the slide there, is Graham Purvis. I'm a staff instructor with Global Knowledge. Uh, I've been teaching for IBM slash PBSC slash Nexian slash Global Knowledge for uh, yeah, over the last 20 years. And one of my areas of focus is SQL Server amongst many others. So um, let's get rolling with uh, this material right here. This is an overview of SQL Server and a look at some of the high availability options for SQL Server. Um, uh, when we take a look at SQL Server, SQL Server has been around a long time. Um, if you go back to the very, very early versions of SQL Server, um, versions of SQL Server up to and including SQL Server 6.5 were binary compatible with Sybase. So uh, Microsoft and Sybase had a technology swap there. Uh, from SQL Server 7, Microsoft deviated significantly in terms of the underlying storage engine um, for SQL Server. And from that point forward, SQL Server really became its own product. Um, as you go through and take a look at SQL Server 2000, Microsoft starts to introduce some XML handling functionalities. And uh, SQL Server 2005 is really the first of the modern implementations of SQL Server. SQL Server 2005 introduced things like um, the ability to actually uh, organize your objects together and actually define uh, permissions around sets of objects and things like that. Um, as you go up through the uh, subsequent versions, SQL Server 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, uh, Microsoft is building on top of features and uh, make some modifications to the storage engine again. Um, interestingly, the data center edition has a slightly different storage engine than some of the lower versions. And the net result is that you can actually get higher data capacities with the data center version of SQL Server as compared to some of the lower versions. Um, SQL Server 2014 introduces some very important changes, um, such as in-memory transaction processing. Um, SQL Server 2017 has the next most significant change, and with SQL Server 2017, Microsoft actually ports SQL Server to Linux. Um, Microsoft and Novell had been in a project called Interop for some time, uh, which produced a number of different uh, software products, um, including the ability to actually run .NET framework functionality on top of a Linux operating system. Um, from SQL Server 2017 then, with SQL Server running on top of Linux or a Windows-based server operating system, uh, Microsoft significantly expands the base for um, this database engine. Uh, SQL Server 2019 is the highest variant of uh, SQL Server that is available for on-prem deployment and uh, still is being maintained and updated. Um, we'll have support out to about uh, 2030 with that version. Um, the highest version that you could be running at this particular point in time would be a 2012 variant, but uh, that is uh, beyond its mainstream support, end of life. So you should actually be on versions higher than SQL Server 2012. So when we take a look at the uh, variants of SQL Server that are actually available for on-prem deployment, um, you have the Enterprise Edition. The Enterprise Edition is the flagship version. 100% of all features, functions, capabilities, and et cetera are present in the Enterprise Edition. Um, the Standard Edition um, loses a number of extended functionality. So for example, if I set up database mirroring, I can only do that um, in the absence of a witness and therefore no uh, failover. When I'm setting up an availability group, we have limitations in terms of uh, the number of things you can actually do in availability group, and et cetera. So the Standard Edition saves you a little bit of money for the SKU, but does lose several features. So 
if you're actually looking at a deployment of SQL Server on-prem, what you need to do is look at the features that are actually available in the standard edition, determine if any of the features that are actually absent are going to impact your deployment, and if they are, you're going to have to actually go up to the standard edition. Uh, there's also a business intelligence variant of SQL Server, which again is a slightly different SKU with a different set of features and slightly different licensing. Um, the developer edition of SQL Server has 100% feature compatibility with the enterprise edition. However, it is not legal for use in a production environment. Obviously, the purpose of the developer edition is to trick the developers into using features that are in the enterprise edition, and therefore you have to actually deploy the enterprise edition, right? Um, there is an express edition of SQL Server, which is free. Um, the express edition of SQL Server has significant limitations uh, in terms of processing capacity and scalability, et cetera, uh, but it is free, not only free to install, but free to redistribute. So. A number of products are redistributed with the Express Edition. Uh, there is also the WID Windows Internal Database. Uh, the WID or Windows Internal Database is built into Windows Server and automatically gets deployed during the installation of various different services. So when you're installing, for example, Windows Update Service on a Windows Server 2016, 2019 server, it's going to prompt you, hey, where's your production level SQL server? You go, I don't have one. It goes, OK, we'll deploy a WID for you. Um, and several other services have a similar behavior on top of the operating systems. So that's ostensibly SQL Server Express built in to Windows Server and automatically deployed when you're actually deploying a service. Uh, there is also a compact edition of SQL Server, which originally was designed to run on Windows CE, the compact edition of Windows, which was for handheld devices. Um, that has been ported over and is available to actually run on top of the Windows Phone OS, if anybody's actually got uh, an interest in that. Uh, we then have the Azure SQL database. Uh, the Azure SQL database is a moving target because it gets updated with new features, functionalities, et cetera. On about every six weeks basis, they actually apply new features, new functions, new capabilities to the Azure SQL database. Um, the Azure SQL database is a platform as a service offering, meaning you have very, very little Ability, visibility into what's actually going on underneath the hood. Uh, you just sort of get a database and you use the database. Um, with regard to the Azure SQL Server database, the Azure SQL Server database has a subset of the features and functionalities that are available in the Enterprise Edition on-prem. So um, when you're actually looking at deploying a SQL Server in the cloud, if the features that are missing and the capabilities that are missing in the platform as a service offering are going to be a stumbling block to you, you could spin up virtual machines in an IaaS infrastructure as a server environment, service environment rather, and you could actually deploy the full enterprise edition with of course the cost of enterprise licensing, virtual machine licensing, et cetera, in there. So you don't necessarily have to go with the SQL, Azure SQL Server database if you're actually going to a cloud implementation you can actually run standard edition, enterprise edition in virtual machines on top of a cloud service. Um, SQL Server 2017 and 2019 support Linux. Uh, the Linux distributions that are officially supported include Red Hat Enterprise, which is a, a version or a distribution of, of uh, Linux that has a support contract associated with it. Um, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, again, a variant of Linux that has a support contract associated with it, and Ubuntu Server. And what you'll actually find is that most of the demonstrations versions of um, SQL Server on top of Linux are actually running on top of Ubuntu um, simply because they don't have that additional uh, support contract um, associated with the Ubuntu server there. So um, uh, there is also the ability to actually run SQL Server as a Docker container image. Um, when you actually take a look at uh, Docker container images, Docker container images are fundamentally ephemeral, so an SQL Server running in a container must actually access external storage, and SMB storage is the preference in this particular case. Um, when you actually take a look at that, when Microsoft originally built a production-level container for SQL Server, it was actually built on top of the Windows variant. Um, the current supported 
container variant of SQL Server is Linux only. Uh, there are some evaluation things that you can actually do on Windows in a Docker container, but Linux only uh, containers in this particular case for production level SQL servers. So when you actually do an installation of SQL Server on-prem, you are provided with a number of subordinate features. Um, you get to choose which of those features you want to actually deploy. Um, that will include the database engine itself. Um, there is also an implementation called Analysis Services. Uh, when you take a look at Analysis Services, Analysis Services allows me to actually take data which is currently in a relational database, usually a, a data warehouse, and uh, perform uh, aggregations by structuring the data into a multi-dimensional data structure called a data cube. And then I can actually run analysis engines against the data that has been aggregated into the data cube. Um, we have SQL Server Integration Services. Integration Services is a set of tools for performing data movements. Um, so I go in and I actually use Visual Studio to actually build out an SSIS package. The SSIS package defines an ETL, Extract, Transform, and Load operation. So we have that as an optional subcomponent here. Um, we have reporting services. Reporting services allows us to actually deploy an IIS-based web service that has the ability to actually handle RDL language and therefore I can actually upload RDL objects into the web server. The web server then has backend connectivity into either a analysis services database or a relational database. Uh, we have a subcomponent called master data services, master data services being a solution for a situation where you actually have multiple copies of data. You need to maintain a single coherent view of that data. Um, similarly, data quality services falls into that same uh, same general area. Um, you have Stream Insight allowing you to actually evaluate data under movement. Um, you have a feature here called Full Text Search. Um, SQL Server has built in indexing, which are very, very efficient when indexing discrete values. However, um, SQL Server and internal indexing isn't so great at handling um, random text strings. So uh, when you actually take a look at that, full text search is the indexing service that was originally designed for IIS being built into the SQL Server, allowing us to actually read and index large blocks of uh, unstructured text so that we can actually search that more efficiently and effectively using a different model for running indexing operations than the SQL Server's internal indexing. Um, SQL Server supports replication, um, allowing us to actually move data or maintain multiple copies of the data. We also support database mirroring as an overall solution for getting data between sites. Um, SQL Server supports uh, Power Pivot and Power View. Uh, SQL Server also incorporates a function called Polybase. Um, when we take a look at Polybase, Polybase is a um, extension to the SQL server and the SQL language, allowing me to write queries that look similar to SQL queries, but have those actually submitted for execution to a new cluster and then have the results returned back and actually synthesized by the SQL server. So this is a ability for SQL Server to actually integrate um, no SQL databases through Hadoop. Uh, we also have machine learning services, including R and Python uh, support in uh, SQL Server. So a number of different service functionalities that are actually built into the operating system there. Um, when we take a look at scalability of an SQL Server instance, um, when you measure the SQL server, you can actually have up to 50 independent instances running on a single physical standalone server. Um, the term instance in this particular case incorporates the concept of a application service with memory and storage and compute capacity, et cetera, assigned. 
So if I have two instances running on the same physical hardware, um, there is no overlap between the two. They are effectively competing for the underlying hardware resources and therefore have a security perimeter associated with them and have a compute perimeter associated with them. So if I was building a application solution and I was going to be provisioning that application solution to multiple tenants, for example, I could actually run one instance per tenant and that instance would have absolute isolation from all other instances, whether those instances are running on other machines or running on the same machine really, really wouldn't matter. Um, when we take a look at a failover cluster within a failover cluster, we can have up to 50 instances provided you're actually using SMB based storage as a back end, uh, 25 instance if you're using SAN storage within a cluster. A Windows cluster incidentally can actually have up to 64 nodes in it um, with Azure Stack HC. I, uh, the maximum number of nodes has been dropped from 64 down to 16. Uh, Azure Stack HCI is the new on-prem version of uh, Windows Server. Uh, when we take a look at an individual instance of SQL Server, it can have up to 32,000 individual databases on a single instance, and each of those databases can theoretically be up to 524 terabytes. 24,000 rather terabytes. Um, these are theoretical numbers um, as opposed to the actual physical capacity that you could actually have, which is dependent on the storage hardware that you can actually make available to the SQL server directly or indirectly. Uh, maximum compute capacity of a single instance of SQL Server database engine. Um, the operating system can scale. The Windows Server 2019 operating system, 2016 operating system, can scale up can scale up to 64 uh, sockets multiplied by the number of cores per socket. So uh, depending on the documentation, you can actually get up to 360 or 640 cores actually available to a single physical machine. And of course, you can actually then bring to bear multiple servers in order to actually add more scalability. Uh, maximum memory in Windows Server 2019, the operating system max is 24 terabytes and SQL Server Enterprise Edition has the ability to actually address all of that memory theoretically once again. However, if I did have a server with multiple terabytes of RAM, I would likely be running multiple instances of SQL Server on top of there, as opposed to dedicating that all to a single instance. However, in terms of overall capacity, uh, you can actually scale to those levels. Um, Side note, um, we will actually take a look at the questions after we're finished getting through the slides here because uh, there's a lot of information to go through here um, in a short period of time. Okay, so uh, when we actually take a look at client tools, the flagship administration tools for SQL Server is SSMS, the SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, the SQL Server Management Studio is built on top of SMO objects, SQL Server Management Objects and is a Windows only operating system tool. It is, however, the flagship or primary tool for actually managing SQL Server, although it can only install on a Windows based operating system, you can manage SQL Server is running on both Windows and on top of Linux from the SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, we have SSDT, SSDT, SQL Server Data Tools are a set of plugins to Visual Studio. Uh, the plugins to Visual Studio allow you to actually build out projects that will then leverage the various different functionalities in SQL Server. So I can build a reporting server project, an integration services project, et cetera, inside Visual Studio. I can then actually compile that out and actually deploy it so that I can actually run it on my SQL Server infrastructure here. Uh, so that's integrated with Visual Studio. Uh, you have SQL CMD. This is a pure command line interface. Uh, the SQL CMD command line interface has been ported over and therefore is available for both Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Um, PowerShell has likewise been ported over to uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Um, one interesting factor associated with the porting of um, SQL CMD and PowerShell SQL commandlets to Linux is the fact that um, the SQL CMD is no longer automatically installed when you install SQL Server. Neither are the SQL PowerShell modules. You have to deliberately go and download and install those independently of the SQL Server data engine. Uh, we have 
Azure Data Studio. Azure Data Studio is a open source SQL server administration and management tool. When we take a look at Azure Data Studio, it has ports for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS as well. Um, one of the most interesting features of Azure Data Studio is the incorporation of Jupyter Notebooks into the uh, interface so that I can actually build out a Jupyter Notebook with a bunch of queries. I can actually send that to somebody. They can execute the queries and capture the results into the Jupyter Notebook, things like that. So there's some interesting capabilities in Azure Data Studio. Uh, we also have Visual Studio Code. Uh, Visual Studio Code is ported to both Windows, Linux, and Mac OS and allows me to download and install SQL Server modules so I can connect to SQL Server and build an application service that actually interacts with SQL Server. Uh, there is a uh, subcomponent in Azure called Azure Data Factory. Azure Data Factory is focused around moving data from one location to another. Uh, we also have the SQL Server Migration Assistants. Um, there are numerous SQL Server Migration Assistants that are actually available. Uh, they are built around the Windows platform, but there is a Migration Assistant for Oracle. There's a Migration Assistant for Sybase. There's a Migration Assistant for Postgres. There's a Migration assistant for um, several other database platforms um, so that you can build a solution to actually migrate data from another platform into your SQL Server database instance. So um, some of the most significant features that have been introduced into SQL Server, um, SQL Server 2014 introduced in-memory OLTP. Uh, In-memory OLTP represents a new transaction processing model. So when you actually take a look at standard relational databases running SQL Server, uh, you use uh, transaction processing, which is written into transaction logs, which are on disk and uses a pessimistic locking model. Um, when you take a look at OLT, uh, in-memory OLTP, you are moving over to a new data structure called column store indexing. And with column store indexing, Microsoft has introduced an optimistic locking model based transaction processing solution where uh, we go ahead, we actually process your transaction without locking any data first. And then we go back, determine whether we had any conflicts and we did roll everything back and start again. Um, when we actually take a look at this, therefore the two transaction processing models are side by side on the same server simultaneously. And within a single database application, I can actually have some tables that are actually leveraging the new in-memory OLTP and some tables that are actually running based upon row tables um, and using the standard transaction model. You don't have to choose one or the other. You can apply the appropriate solution based upon the nature of the data and the transaction processing that you're actually working with within the context of a single application. Um, SQL Server 2014 also introduced Buffer Pool Extension, um, which is ostensibly a solution so that SQL Server can manage its own swap to disk, right? Um, this is designed for servers that have relatively low memory, um, less than 64 gigs of RAM, let's say, and are therefore going to overstretch the boundaries of the RAM that is actually present. You can actually have SQL Server manage its own swap functionalities there. Um, SQL Server 2016 introduced a number of new technologies, including temporal tables. Uh, temporal tables allow us to go through and actually um, monitor the activity that's going on within a table and go back in and view the data as it was at any point in the past. So this gives us internal um, historical information actually being maintained. Uh, with a introduced always encrypted. Always encrypted is a solution whereby the client is actually applying encryption to the data before sending it to the server. Therefore, the server itself does not have access to the data and anybody accessing the data on the server would have to retrieve it, then decrypt it on the client system in order to gain access to that. Uh, they introduced dynamic data masking, the ability to, without encryption, hide data from end users based upon a permission level structure. Uh, you have row level security, um, stretch 
databases, stretch databases allow you to actually have a single table where the active portion of the table is physically on prem, but the rest of the data from the table is actually sitting in an Azure instance of SQL Server. And by doing that, you get nearly unlimited storage capacity. Um, this works only in a situation where that storage data becomes effectively read-only. It's not designed to actually handle transaction processing in Azure uh, when we actually migrate a portion of the data up there. Um, SQL Server 2017 included a function called automatic database tuning. So there are several tuning capabilities that have been built into SQL Server over the years. Uh, we can actually automate applying those to uh, the server based upon server self-monitoring. We get Linux support. Uh, we also have the inclusion of machine learning services, including Python and R language. SQL Server 2019 introduces secure enclaves, the ability for the server to decrypt the data that is actually encrypted by the client when you're actually using always encrypted. You also have data discovery and classification, as well as labeling and protecting sensitive data um, in, introduced in SQL Server 2019. So a number of different features there. Uh, when we take a look at SQL Server's high availability, um, we have the primary high availability solution here, which is always on availability groups. Always on availability groups have been available in some form since about SQL Server 2005 in one form or another. Um, the full implementation is actually available only in our enterprise edition. There is, however, the standard edition, which has a basic availability group that's actually built into it. Uh, we always have always on, we also have always on failover clustering where you fail over at the instance level. So an availability group fails over at the database level and provides for the separation of read, write and read only traffic to different servers. Whereas a always on availability cluster is going to actually focus on high availability of the instance, not of the individual database. Um, clustering has been available for some time and is fully supported in enterprise and standard edition. Uh, we also have replication. Um, in this particular case, replication has been available for some time. We have multiple modalities for actually performing replication, but replication is not focused on multiple simultaneous access to the data necessarily, but on maintaining multiple copies of the data. Um, if you need identical data, then there's database mirroring and the always on availability groups are based upon database mirroring technologies in order to get the data from server to server. That is supported in both the enterprise and standard edition. However, the standard edition implementation of database mirroring does not include automated failover. Uh, we have a scale out server federation. Um, federated databases actually involve effectively sharding your database or breaking your single database into chunks to actually distribute it across multiple physical instances of SQL Server. Uh, we also have uh, scale databases with a shard mapper. With Shard mapper is a functionality that's available in Azure specifically. Uh, we can do a high available solution called log shipping. Uh, log shipping entails taking backups of the SQL server and deploying it to another SQL server um, where that SQL server is generally offline most of the time. You can bring it online for read-only access, but generally is offline most of the time and would then be brought to speed in the case of a disaster and brought up quickly. And you can actually do that on any version of SQL Server. Um, you also have host clustering. Host clustering, of course, is transparent to the SQL Server, where the SQL Server is running in a virtual machine on top of a clustered host operating system. And therefore, the cluster can move the entire virtual machine from server to server. Um, when you actually take a look at implementations of always on failover clustering and always on availability groups, these are generally deployed within a host cluster scenario. So you have high availability of the operating system on which the SQL server is running, plus high availability of the databases or the instance through your always on availability group or always on failover clustering. So it's not an or, it's an and. 
So um, the flagship solution here is an always on availability group. When you take a look at an always on availability group, you have a primary replica. The primary replica is read write. So all transactional operations must physically be processed against the read write replica. But you can actually have multiple secondary replicas. Um, the secondary replicas are all read only. In Windows Server 26, uh, 2016, you could have two secondary replicas. Um, in 2017, you'd have three. Uh, in 2019, you can have four synchronous replicas out of a total of eight secondaries. And when you actually take a look at those eight, eight secondaries, the eight secondaries are actually being populated via database mirroring. Uh, the difference in this particular case is synchronous are running real time updates, whereas asynchronous can fall behind the read write copy when they're actually doing that. Uh, when you actually take a look at this synchronous commit mode allows for automatic failover. You can also perform manual failover. That is to move the primary replica to one of the synchronous secondaries. Um, the most critical capability that we actually have with this is failovers at the database level, but more importantly, the secondary replicas, particularly the synchronous read only replicas can actually be assigned to handle read only activity. So there is a connector option switch that the client can actually use to say, I will only be doing read only activity. And there is a cluster service which actually handles inbound communications and will therefore direct that client to one of the synchronous read only replicas, whereas the clients that are actually coming in and need to actually do modification will be directed to the primary replica. Hence, you can actually get scalability because read only activities and particularly heavy duty read only activities like report generation and stuff like that can be handed off and processed on a read only replica while the primary replica is actually handled handling just the transactional throughput. So that provides one of the primary benefits of actually using an availability group. When we take a look at always on failover clusters in a Windows Server operating system 2016, 2019, you can have up to 64 nodes in the cluster. Across that, you can have 50 instances of SQL Server actually running. Um, always on failover cluster focuses on availability of the instance rather than availability of the individual database. As such, an instance will have access to the resources of only a single physical server at a time. If that server is also running other instances of SQL Server, then we have to share hardware resources with the other instances, but the failover is at the instance level. So if anything happens to one of the nodes in the cluster, the instance will be moved to another node in the cluster automatically. Hence, we maintain high availability at the instance level rather than the individual database level. And you can, of course, combine this with guest clustering, which is to say you can actually be running the operating systems that SQL Server is actually executing in on top of virtual machines. So you can have a failover cluster in guest operating systems. You can have an availability group in guest operating systems. And that is the primary mode of deployment for both of those high availability solutions. Uh, when we take a look at replication, there are a number of replication technologies built into SQL Server. Um, we have transactional replication. Um, when you actually set up transactional replication, you have some interesting capabilities, specifically the fact that you can pull data from a non-SQL server and actually use SQL Server's replication services to replicate it out to other machines. Not only can you pull data from a non-SQL server, you can actually push data to a non-SQL server. So for example, I could actually have an Oracle server as the source or an Oracle server as the destination of replication. Um, transactional replication is not real time. There is latency. The transaction gets processed against one node, then it gets captured, then it gets sent to the uh, second node and then applied to the secondary node. So you have to understand that there is always latency in all these replication solutions here. Uh, merge replication facilitates having multiple active members so that when you're actually replicating data between 
servers, I could have, let's say, three servers, all of them able to actually make modifications to the data, all of them then replicating changes. What then would happen if a replication conflict occurs, there's a replication resolution solution that would actually go through and identify which event or which transactional operation would survive and which one would actually be relegated. And of course, there's a log associated with that. So when you're actually designing a solution for merge replication, you want to make sure that that is unlikely to happen. Uh, we have snapshot replication, which is more or less a solution for simply uh, periodically moving data from one server to another. Peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, the ability to have multiple active and bidirectional, and there's also updatable subscriptions uh, where we can actually allow modifications of the subscription to be forwarded to the um, server where the subscription is actually defined so that it can actually be pushed out to the other. So a uh, number of different solutions here. Um, replication, however, all solutions for replication allow for latency and therefore disconnection. So if I'm looking at, for example, an availability group, an availability group is designed such that all the servers can talk to each other all the times. Whereas, for example, with merge replication, I could have a situation where um, the database was disconnected for a period of time, changes were actually occurring, and then it's reconnected as in the case of a mobile application solution, right? So um, some solutions are appropriate for one scenario, some solutions are appropriate for a completely different scenario. Um, SQL Server security. SQL Server has a number of security features that you would want to be aware of. Um, all versions of SQL Server include TLS, Transport Layer Security, which is more usually known as SSL. Um, in order to be able to actually use that, you must have a PKI infrastructure, you must issue valid TLS certificates to the SQL Server, and then you must actually bind those certificates to the SQL Server in order for them to be used. Um, further, you have to tell the clients to actually use TLS. So although TLS is actually fully supported in all variants of SQL Server, you have to implement it in order to be present. So if you deploy an SQL Server and you have not implemented TLS, all your SQL Server transactional communications are going across the wire unencrypted which is not a great, right? which is potentially a security risk and may put you in violation of various different forms of regulation. So all of them support TLS, but it must be configured in order to actually be in effect. Um, as an alternative to using TLS, which is a layer six, layer seven encryption solution in the OSI reference model, you can use IPsec, which operates at layer three, the, the IP layer of the OSI reference model. And the reason that that is useful is because that is transparent to the applications that are actually using it. In this particular case, the SQL Server will be unaware that you are actually adding a layer of encryption here. And there are hardware encryption accelerators that operate at layer three. Uh, there are also also layer two hardware encryption accelerators that you could actually deploy, um, which would ensure that you had secure communications, despite the fact that you may, or, uh, regardless of whether you actually implemented TLS at layer six, layer seven in the actual application service itself. Um, inside the database, you have, or sorry, uh, between the inside the database and between the client and the database, you have transparent data encryption. Uh, transparent data encryption is supported on both the enterprise and standard editions of SQL Server, not on the lower versions, and it is a client-side encryption model. So a set of encryption keys are actually generated by the client and stored on the client. The data is therefore encrypted by the client, physically sent to the server and stored as ciphertext. The server does have a stored variant of the symmetric keys. However, in the absence of the public and private key pair on the client, you cannot retrieve access the symmetric key and therefore you cannot decrypt the data. However, because the symmetric keys are actually maintained on the server, I can actually take the public and private key pair, deploy that to a additional client and therefore have that client also able to both encrypt and decrypt the data. So um, you can actually scale the model here because of the uh, mechanics associated with the encrypted solution here. Uh, we also have the ability to actually run encryption physically inside the database. We have the ability to run column level encryption. Uh, you always also have, sorry, um, I just misspoke. 
I was describing always encrypted. I was not describing transparent data encryption. Um, always encrypted is the client side encryption. Um, in this case here, TDE transparent data encryption. This is the ability to actually encrypt the individual data pages in which the data is actually stored. This is fully server side. Uh, there is a public private key pair protects a symmetric key, the symmetric key is held in the database, and every individual database, database page is individually encrypted using an encryption key. Therefore, if somebody were to gain access to either a backup of or the actual physical database itself without access to the public and private key pair, um, they would not be able to mount the database. So, I uh, sorry, I misspoke a moment ago. Transparent data encryption is encrypting the data at rest whereas always encrypted is the client side encryption that I was actually describing a moment ago. Uh, we also have the ability to apply encryption to the backups and that's separate and independent from the transparent data encryption here. Um, so we have a number of encryption technologies. We also have server audit. So we can actually set up and monitor activities that are actually occurring inside of the database. And that allows us to be compliant with several sort forms of regulations. Uh, we have data classification and auditing, dynamic data masking. So you can hide data to persons who do not have the appropriate permissions. And you also have row level security, the ability to apply access control list, not only to the entire table or individual column in the table, but distinct groups of rows inside of of the tables, you can actually separate that out. Uh, Azure data offerings. Um, up in Azure, the flagship relational database that Microsoft, that Microsoft actually offers is the Azure SQL Server database. Again, it is a platform as a service offering, which is a subset of the functionality of the enterprise edition of SQL Server that you get to deploy on-prem. As an alternative to that platform as a service offering, you can spin up virtual machines and then install SQL Server into the virtual machines and run the full standard or the full enterprise edition of SQL Server in virtual machines and therefore have 100% of the functionality. In conjunction with either Express Route communication and or a site-to-site -site VPN, you could actually deploy a domain controller in Azure as an additional read-write domain controller on your domain and therefore you could literally extend your data center Center into Azure running on virtual machines. So uh, as an Azure virtual machine running an instance of SQL Server, you have 100% of the functionality of the standard or enterprise edition of SQL Server. And uh, Microsoft actually has pre-built virtual machine images in the marketplace where you can just select that and it automatically prices the per minute cost of the virtual machine based upon not only the virtual machine but also the licensing for the SQL Server instance that's running inside. Uh, we also have Azure Synapse Analytics, which is ostensibly SQL Server Analysis Services as a cloud service. Uh, you have Azure HD Insight, which is a Hadoop implementation in Azure. Uh, you have Azure Cosmos DB, which is based upon MongoDB. You have Azure Database for MySQL, Azure Database for Postgres. Both of those are relational database implementations, which are alternatives to Microsoft's Azure SQL Database. Um, both of those solutions have actually been built around the high availability implementation that is actually built into both of those individual database platforms. So you get a instant deployment of a fully highly available solution there with either of those with just the, just the selection of the button. Um, SQL, uh, Azure also supports a MariaDB implementation and you also have Azure Data Lake Analytics, which is uh, based upon a uh, storage account, Hadoop and analysis services. And there are other concepts in Azure like Databricks and things like that um, that are out of scope for this right here. Um, Azure Stack Integration. So Azure Stack is Microsoft's on-prem implementations of Azure-like technologies. Uh, there are two specific integrations in this particular case right here. Um, Azure Stack Hub, which used to be just called Azure Stack, um, is effectively the ability to actually take an administrative interface that is similar to the Azure admin portal and actually have that executing on-prem, managing System Center Virtual Machine Manager and other infrastructure components on-prem so that you can actually have a cloud-like administrative environment or experience on-prem 
that backends into your on-prem data center. So when you actually take a look at Azure Stack Hub, it has fully automated on-prem SQL Server cluster deployment and the ability to actually deploy, again, automated disaster recovery sites across two Azure Stack environments. So you can actually incorporate multiple data centers into a high availability solution for your SQL Server implementation here on top of Azure Stack Hub. Um, Azure Stack HCI. Azure Stack HCI is the new operating system from Microsoft, which is eventually, I suppose, going to supersede Windows Server 2019. Um, and when you actually take a look, look at Azure Stack HCI 20H2, which is the most recent release of that, um, it allows you to deploy a on-prem hyper-converged cluster and it has solutions that are specific to SQL Server on top of it. Um, when you actually take a look at this, if you go and actually take a look at Azure Stack HCI, there is a marketplace for hardware slash software integrated solutions, pre-tested, pre-validated solutions that you can actually purchase. So you, you instead of purchasing hardware and installing an operating system yourself and building out your cluster and building out your SQL Server, et cetera, you purchase a complete solution from uh, uh, IBM, Lenovo, HP, Dell, whatever it is, which includes the entire hardware software stack all the way through. And um, the fundamental difference between Azure Stack HCI as an operating system and Windows Server 2019 is Azure Stack HCI is licensed in Azure on the same basis that other Azure services are licensed. So it's you're paying for it as if you were paying for a virtual machine based upon the number of cores and et cetera that you're actually operating on your on-prem data center. Okay, so that is uh, on-prem hyper-converged SQL Server clusters and full support for both Linux SQL Server inside that cluster as well as Windows nodes inside those clusters. By the way, you can't mix and match. It has to be one or the other, but not both. So that is integrations with Microsoft's Azure Stack Hub and Azure Stack HCI. Um, when you actually take a look at Azure, the Azure instance of SQL Server, um, Azure instance of SQL Server comes out of the box as a highly available solution. So when I go in and try to connect across the internet to an instance of SQL Server running in Azure, what I'm going to actually hit is a gateway ring, which is going to be highly available. That is going to direct me to the primary replica of the SQL Server database instance. And the storage is actually running down on Azure storage and it heads is actually replicated three times. You're paying for three store, three versions of your storage. And this ostensibly is running in a failover cluster, more or less, because if anything happens to the primary instance, we'll fail over to another node in Azure, connect to the storage where the data is and bring that instance back online very, very rapidly. So the basic implementation of a and as your instance of SQL Server is more or less a failover cluster type instance. However, if you actually go to the premium business critical service tiers um, of Azure SQL Server, what you end up with in SQL Server is in fact a availability group with a single primary replica read write replica in the availability group and one or more secondary read only replicas which are maintained synchronously with the ability to have one of those read only replicas in a different data center in Azure. So you get high availability through what is ostensibly availability groups when you actually go to the uh, premium and business critical service tiers, as opposed to the basic standard and general purpose service tiers, which are more or less failover cluster instances. Okay. So, um, all right, it is 1251. We have a few minutes left here. Uh, let me just go in and take a quick look at some of the questions. Uh, what is the meaning of SQL? Uh, so the term SQL is technically structured query language. Um, structured query language is the model for actually interaction with a relational database. So Oracle is a relational database and Oracle has 
PLSQL, that is the structured query language that actually operates against an Oracle instance. And uh, IBM has DB2, which is a relational database, and DB2 has a SQL language with which you can actually interact with their database. Uh, Microsoft um, adopted the term SQL for their variant of a relational database, um, which actually corresponds, lo uh, corresponds loosely to the SQL ANSI standard language. So the SQL ANSI standard language is valid. I could actually use exactly the same SQL ANSI standard language queries against um, an Oracle database, a Sybase database, a Postgres database, a uh, DB2 database, a Microsoft database, uh, provided that the underlying table structure was identical, I would get exactly the same results. So Microsoft is just uh, playing a marketing game here by naming their database platform, their relational database platform, um, with the name, the generic name for the actual language for interaction with relational databases. Um, so the question, does replication work with SQL Server standard license? Absolutely, yes. Um, replication is fully supported on the standard edition of SQL Server as well as the uh, enterprise edition of SQL Server. Uh, what are the specific risks to be considered when moving SQL Server from on-prem to Azure? Um, in this particular case, when you actually move from an on-prem implementation to Azure, um, first thing is quite simple. You are taking your data and actually pushing it out over the internet and actually storing it in a third party data center, in this particular case, Microsoft data center. Now, Microsoft data centers do go through rigid testing and validation as to their security implementations and et cetera. Your data is automatically going to be stored in an encrypted form which is to say you are actually going to use TDE transparent data encryption in the storage in Azure, right? So only an instance of SQL Server running in Azure that has access to the public and private keys would be able to bring the database online. However, um, Azure automates the distribution of that so that you can actually move the database server from one instance to another transparently, right? So um, the other thing is when you're actually communicating, um, you require TLS. However, when you're actually doing TLS between yourself and Azure, the TLS termination is at Microsoft's edge, not at the instance. So you have a TLS encrypted session between yourself and Microsoft's edge, and then from Microsoft's edge to the internal SQL server, it's only internally, uh, it's gonna be internally encrypted. So um, you have a termination of your encryption at the edge, not at the instance of SQL Server. So uh, there's some things to actually consider there. Um, uh, that incidentally is part of the reason why um, Microsoft actually introduced things like Azure Stack HCI so that you can have an on-prem highly available cluster that is actually running an instance of SQL, that is running a highly available virtual machine with SQL Server running in the virtual machine so that you can actually do your database on-prem as opposed to in Azure. Uh, so that's that. Uh, would there be any high availability options not available in standard edition as to enterprise edition? Yes. If you go back, um, you take a look at the availability groups. The standard edition only has a basic availability group, basically two servers, no failover. Right. Uh, whereas the enterprise edition has the full functionality um, in terms of failover clustering, you can actually do standard failover clustering with two nodes on the standard edition up to um, you can actually go higher multiple nodes in the enterprise edition. So there are limitations on the standard edition with regard to high availability solutions. Um, there's a question in the chat session here for synchronous replication. Is there any distance or latency limitations? Um, if you are actually setting up a stretch cluster, for example, uh, Microsoft's recommendation is that you have less than, um, I think the number was 20 milliseconds latency uh, between the primary and secondary data centers. So I would apply that to um, synchronous replication as well. Um, can you have synchronous replication between Azure, North, and so Central? Um, in this particular case, are you talking about SQL Server running in virtual machines, or are you talking about the Azure SQL? Right. 
if you're talking about Azure SQL and you're actually going with the business premium additions, which is an availability group, um, you do, I believe, get to identify the two data centers in which the primary and one of the read-only uh, replicas would actually be deployed. So I believe you do get that option there. Uh, I'd have to look at it specifically for uh, uh, for South America, because I'm not, I, I would have to look at the specifics of the relationship, but I would assume that those are peered data centers. And if they're peered data centers, you absolutely would be able to do that. Uh, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. Looks like that may be all the questions. Uh, Graham, thank you so much again. Uh, this was a probably two hours worth of content pushed into one hour. Lots of really, really helpful information. So thanks again uh, for delivering this webinar. Folks, uh, again, the, the um, webinar itself, the recording will be sent out approximately a week from today. You should see that. The only reason you would not see that is if your company opted out of, of receiving uh, any sort of uh, marketing emails, um, so if that's the case, please reach out to Global Knowledge. Also, Graham, if you don't mind just advancing the slide one more time, mm -hmm. um, we want to make, just for those that attended today, we want to make it as easy as possible for you uh, if you do have greater interest or would like more formalized training, um, perhaps a three or a five day class, um, lots of options that we have at Global Knowledge. And, and in making that easy for you, uh, we want to offer 25% off each of these classes just for attending. And I believe on the next slide, Graham, there's a uh, promo code that you can use in checking out. Um, yes, here it is, US Webinar 25. Um, and if you're, if you're dialing in from anywhere else, um, you can use one of these to be able to get 25% off of your next course uh, with Global Knowledge, just as a thank you for attending. So thank you again. If you, if you haven't been to globalknowledge.com, do that. It will show you the next upcoming webinars like this. And there's also a, uh, just a slew of white papers, helpful resources, course catalog for you to take a look at. So thanks again, Graham. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day. Bye now.